In today's study, we have a guest speaker, Michael Ramston, International Director of Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, addressing the subject, Has the Christian Faith Failed You? This out loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I am saved. Healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I am a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus name. Amen. Could you please remain standing. This morning we are delighted. To have uh, Michael Ramsden with us. He is the uh, international director for RZIM. And he's been part of RZIM. Since its foundation in Europe in 1997. Uh, Michael is also the joint director of the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. Uh, interestingly, Michael was raised in the Middle East and he later moved to England where he has, uh, uh, where he worked for the Lord Chancellor's Department Investing Funds. And he's got a lot of background to him. He's, uh, he's done research in law and economics at Sheffield University. He taught moral philosophy and lectured for the International Seminar for Jurisprudence and Human Rights in Strasbourg. Uh, he's also been a professor in residence at the Wolfsburg Executive Institute in Switzerland and he's lectured in various set settings including the White House in Washington DC. Uh, he's also addressed leaders at the NATO headquarters in Brussels, the members of the European Parliament as well as bankers and investment managers uh, on, the, on the global financial crisis and so on. So uh, he's, he's done a lot and God's used him greatly and so it's a huge honor for us to have uh, Michael. Uh, he lives in Oxford with his wife Anne and their three children. I think they're one of the daughters is here with us this morning. I forgot your name. Lucy. Okay, his daughter Lucy is also with us here this morning. All right. So let's put our hands together. Let's give Michael a warm welcome as he comes and brings God's word to us. Well, it's a... Um Real joy for me to be here uh, in India, uh, especially uh, with my family. Um, why don't we take a brief word of prayer and then we will sit. Father, we ask, Lord, that you may meet with us, that you may speak to us, Lord, that we may hear you. Uh, Father, Lord, that we may leave from this place, Lord, refreshed and strengthened, Lord, having encountered you this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Um, well... It's uh, nice not only to be in, in, in India, but also to be in India with my uh, notebook. Um, the very first time I came here, about 20 years ago, I was on a British Airways flight, and I was going to various different cities around India, and when I landed, uh, I came, but my luggage didn't. Uh, in their geographical wisdom, they sent me to India and my luggage to Indiana in the US. And, uh, and it, then it followed me all around India. I never got reunited with my luggage until three weeks le later, just as I was leaving. And it reminded me of um, a story when British Airways launched the Concorde service from London to New York, New York which is now stopped, because the plane flew at two and a half times the speed of sound. It meant that when you landed in New York, you arrived before you'd taken off time-wise in London. So they used to advertise the service from London to New York, a picture of the Concorde, and underneath they had the strap line, lunch in London, breakfast in New York. The idea being, you know, that you could arrive before you left, you know, in order to do business. And, uh, and one of the big posters in London, a student came along with a spray can of paint and wrote underneath, and luggage in India. Uh, so anyway, I'm here, I'm here with my family and with my luggage and with my notebook. It is a real privilege and joy to be here. Now, uh, the message I have uh, for you here is originally uh, a message I put together when I was speaking uh, with uh, Dr. Ravi Zacharias several years ago when we teamed up together to address the subject, Has the Christian Faith Failed You? And he has gone on since to write a book about it. 
And you may well be able to get hold of it if this is a theme that interests you. And, but what I really want to try and do is look at that question because it is one that at times we raise. And certainly as I travel around the world um, and meet with people for breakfast, lunch, or after I've preached somewhere and they take me to one side, they'll very often begin to ask me something. And it's very clear that they're asking something as it relates to them. Is this right? Can I depend on it? Is it even capable of being right? Or this is my experience of it. And so what I'm going to try and do is take three broad areas in which people think that either the Christian faith has failed or, may, or maybe will fail and look at each one uh, individually. And then, then towards the end of it, we'll come and we'll bring uh, God's, to, God's word to bear on all of this. But the very first broad area in which people fear or think that the Christian faith may fail or indeed has failed is philosophical. In other words, they say, look, what you believe is not real or true. That's why it's a faith. Now, when I first started traveling around the world, um, sometimes people would say to me, Michael, I'm so happy for you. I can see how happy you are believing what you believe. And I wish I could believe what you believe, but I can't. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever said that to you. But when you hear the same thing again and again and again, different cultures, different countries, you think, why are you all telling me the same thing? And what they were basically saying is this, Michael, you seem to obviously have found a joy in your life by becoming a Christian. And I am so happy that you have so much happiness. But the reason you are happy is because of you believe in Jesus and he doesn't exist. Now, what do you call people who believe in things that are not there? The answer is mad people. So they're actually saying, Michael, you are insane. But the main thing is, is that you are happy and insane. And I'm so desperate to know happiness myself, I too have considered embracing insanity just so I could join you and join in with the joy. But I just, I, I can't do it. I'm too rational, I'm too scientific, I'm too whatever. I cannot possibly believe this. Now it is true that the Bible uses the word faith and we talk about having a strong faith. But we need to understand what that biblical word means. Because although the Bible says that faith is a gift, it is not the gift of stupidity. The Greek word translated faith, every time you read your New Testament and you see the word faith, it only ever comes from one Greek word, pistis. Now that Greek noun, pistis, comes from a verb, pito, which means to be persuaded. It means that you are persuaded something is true and real, therefore you can put your trust in it. That's why in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 it says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Now if it's not possible to please God without faith, you better know what faith is. And very handily, the next part of Hebrews 11 says, and faith is. So great, without faith it is impossible to please God, and faith is. And then it says two things, knowing that he is. Not hoping that he is, thinking that he is, wishing that he is, wondering if he is, knowing that he is. That is a statement about truth and reality. He is even if you don't want to believe in him. God doesn't cease to exist even if you don't want him to be. Whether you like your local politicians or your local uh, church leaders or your local family or whatever it is, even if you stop believing in them, it doesn't mean they cease to exist. They still are. And faith is knowing that God is. And he is a rewarder of those who earnestly or diligently seek him. Well, what's that about? Well, that's about reality. That's about the fact that you can rely on God. He is trustworthy. You can rely on his promises. He is not the kind of person who, if you ask for bread, will give you a stone. Or if you need fish, will instead provide you with a scorpion. You can trust him. God is true, he is, and he is trustworthy. He is true to his word. How do you put your faith in anyone? Let's suppose I was to say to you, look, I have faith in your pastor. I am saying two things about him. Number one, he actually exists. He is there. 
And number two, he keeps his promises. If he says, Michael, come to my church, you can come and speak at it, that when I come, there will be a church and I'll be allowed to speak. Now, interestingly, he didn't promise me that anyone would come, but he did promise me the opportunity to speak. You put your trust in someone if you are sure that they are real and true. Faith is always a response to truth and reality. Do you know that truth? Do you know that reality? Faith is not a leap into the dark. Nowhere in the Bible does it talk about faith as a stepping into the dark. Faith is always a stepping into the light. And light allows you to see where things are. God shines a light into this world so that we can see truth, so that we can see reality and respond to it. Faith is the only appropriate response to a God who is real and who has revealed himself and made himself known. Do you know that truth? Now, of course, there are some people who have concluded that you cannot know truth. There is nothing to be found. Several years ago, I remember um, reading a book. It's the story of a guy called Antoine Roquentin. And when this book was first published in French, it was called The Diary of Antoine Roquentin. And it may surprise you to know that this book is the fictional diary of a man called Antoine Roquentin. The clue is in the title. And this young man is looking for meaning and purpose. He's trying to figure out why he is here. And he hasn't got a clue. And one day he's sitting on a hillside and he's looking at a chestnut tree. And as he looks at the chestnut tree, he has this revelation, this, this inspiration, this insight. And he feels he has finally got the answer he always wanted. And he writes in this fictional diary, without formulating anything clearly in my mind, I realized I had the key to life itself. Now, do you want to hear it? What is the key to life itself? Well, here's what he wrote in the diary, that the world of explanation is not the world of reality. What does he mean by that? He's saying there are two worlds. There's one world over here that only exists in my mind. It's a world in which I'm looking for meaning, purpose, truth, justice, morality. That's the world that exists in my head. And then I have another world over here. That's the real world with houses, cars, streets, trees, and so on. And what is happening, he says, is that the world that only exists in my head, in my imagination, is trying to impose itself on the world of reality. It's trying to find meaning when there isn't any. It's trying to find truth when there isn't any. It's trying to find justice when it isn't. There are two totally separate worlds. And then he has to decide which world he wants to live in. And as he thinks about this, he begins to feel ill. He begins to feel physically, emotionally, spiritually sick. Sick to the pit of his stomach. Which is why when this book was first published in English, it was published with a new one-word title, Nausea, by the French writer Jean-Paul Sartre. Because that one word, Nausea, summed up the whole condition. What happens if we're looking for something that simply isn't there? What then? But the incredible thing is that that philosophy of, is ultimately totally unsustainable. Even as he sits there saying this is the way reality is and this is how I think my mind is, he's still using his mind to make a distinction about what is real and what isn't real and which one belongs in both, which shows that somehow he can actually connect the two in a meaningful way. We're looking for a truth and a reality that we can be sure of, that we can depend on. Now here's the challenge. As I travel around the world, I'm constantly meeting people who will ask with me. And they'll sit down and they'll say, but Michael, look, I read the Bible. I've been praying. I go to church, sometimes even for decades. And now it seems to have gone. I've lost it. It's not there. How do I make sense of this? And here we have to ask ourselves something very clearly. Because you cannot lose what you never had. You cannot lose what you never had. 
There are all kinds of people who are very often trying to persuade themselves that somehow they are a Christian by what they're doing. And the very reason that we sometimes are fearful to ask questions if we're in that position is we know if we begin to ask questions, the whole system will collapse. If you are sat here and you're trying to persuade yourself that the Christian faith is true, you need to realize something very important. Faith is not psychological. Jesus Christ has revealed himself in reality and history. You find out about it by asking questions. The very fear you may have of asking questions is preventing you from getting to that true knowledge of the truth and of the real. Questions have to be asked. So there's nothing wrong with saying, is there any evidence that Jesus Christ claimed to be God? Where in the Bible does he say that? Is there any evidence that he rose from the dead? Where is it? Can I look into it? I would encourage you to do it. It's not enough just to claim something. It's not the fact that even if Jesus claimed it's true, is it true? Do you know the story of a psychiatrist who was moved from one city to another? And as he was doing the rounds, he was going round from one bed to another, and he was asking people who they were. And he came to one man, and he was sat upright in his bed. He had his hand tucked under his jacket like this, and he was wearing a hat that went this way with a large feather in it. And then the psychiatrist said, who are you? And the man said, I am Napoleon. And the psychiatrist said, well, who told you that? And the man said, God told me. And the man in the bed next to him said, I did not. (laughs) It's one thing to claim to be God. How do you know that claim is true? Well, this is where history, archaeology is so important. If you have never looked into it, look into it. This is why the role of prophecy in the Old Testament in predicting Jesus' coming is so important. There are so many prophecies about the coming of Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, that it will be impossible for one person to randomly fulfill them. Now, sometimes people say to me, look, Jesus was a clever guy. He was aware of all of these prophecies, so he lived his life to make it look like he was fulfilling the prophecies. But some of these prophecies concern where he will be born and who his parents will be. That is something very hard to control on the other side of the womb. Look into it. Is it true? Is it real? It's not coincidence. Even if you have never tried crying out to God, or you've lost your Christian habit of coming before God in prayer, seek Him in prayer, you may be surprised by what you see. I have a good friend in England. um, uh, He has a similar uh, heritage to myself. um, uh, And he's an evangelist. He, He has two names. John, that's his first name, and then his surname, John. Uh, he, he, uh, it's because in uh, Greek, um, you can be Yanis Yanu, and it's very, very common. Uh, so my first cousin is Michael Michaelides, and so on. Does that make sense? You have, you, you know, it has a rhyme to it, so you name people that way. Now, he goes by the name of, so he, he writes his name, J, the letter J, dot, and then John. Now, a lot of people, as a result, think his name is J, J-A-Y, J John. But actually, it's just because it's confusing when he says his name is John John. Okay, people think that he has a stutter. So anyway, there's one story he loves telling. I love it. Imagine the following scenario with me. Imagine a, a pastor of a young, thriving church in a city with a lot of technology in it and his beautiful wife uh, sitting in their home one day and they're watching TV together and the children come running into the house Because a couple of weeks ago, they adopted a small cat, and they've been feeding it in the backyard. And this tiny little cat has climbed all the way up to a very tall, thin tree. And it's stuck up there, and it's crying. And they come, Daddy, Daddy, you're a wonderful man. You can do anything. You need to get the cat out of the tree. So, you know, the father, he's a busy man. He's the pastor of a big church. He reluctantly, he comes outside, and he surveys the problem. He sees the tree. He sees his children and how upset they are. He sees how tall how high in the tree the cat is. But then he has a very clever idea. He says, kids, I know what I'll do. Bring me that very long electrical extension cable we have. And he makes a lasso. And he throws it and he lassoes the top of the tree. And then he takes the other side of the tree and he ties it to the back of his car. And he says, kids, what I'll do is this. I will drive slowly along. And as I go forward slowly, the tree will bend down lower and lower and lower And when the tree is low enough, you can reach up and you can rescue the kitten. And they say, Daddy, you are the 
best, you are so clever, this is genius. So he lassoes the top of the tree. He ties the other end to the back of his car. He starts driving forward. As he drives forward, the tree is bending, bending, bending. It's getting lower and lower when all of a sudden the rope snaps, the tree springs upright, and the cat is launched into the air. And that's the end of the story. Now, two weeks later, another young couple with kids had joined his church. And because he's a good pastor, he goes to visit them. They only live a couple of blocks away from where he is. And as he's visiting them, they say, Pastor, would you like some chai? And then he does that thing that none of us in the West can understand with his head, which seems to say yes or no at the same time. And they're somehow able to discern because they can speak this tongue. And they come back with a nice tray, 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 uh, tray of chai. And as they are putting it on the table, this kitten walks into the room and sits on the carpet. And the pastor, he looks at the kitten, and he looks at the couple and their kids, and he says, that's a very nice kitten you have. Have you had her very long? And the woman says, pastor, you will never believe this. <laughs> Two weeks ago, we were sitting on the balcony of our apartment here in this place, just after we moved in. My six-year-old son to me came to me and said, Mommy, please, can we have a cat? And I said, no, we've talked about this before. It's not clean. It's not hygienic. We live in an apartment. It's totally impractical. He kept begging me and begging me, Mommy, I want a cat. So eventually, I lost it. I said to him, okay, son, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get down on our knees right now and pray to the Lord Jesus Christ for a cat. If he wants you to have one, he can send you one. Pastor, you won't believe what happened next. So often we think... That the way God answers our prayer is through coincidence. And all I can tell you is this after th so many decades of Christian life. Is the more you pray the more of these coincidental answers to prayer you will see. Seek him. Ask him. He is interested in you. Talk to him. The Christian faith is true and real. Now. This flows really into the second broad category of why we sometimes feel the Christian faith has failed or may fail us, and it's existential. It's to do with our feelings and our expectations what we want. Now, I used to joke that, you know, there were two broad categories of these people who felt that God had let them down. One were people who'd gone to church and didn't like their pastor, and then a smaller group of pastors who went to church and found they didn't like the people. But the problem is much more complicated than that. So let me just start with this. If you have been brought here as a guest today because they said that, you know, it would be interesting and you're already feeling angry because your friend lied to you because it's not interesting. But if what has put you off the Christian faith is interaction with other Christians or you have questions about it, I'd like to just share something with you. In the book of Galatians, we read a letter from one of the very first Christians. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to do two things in his letter. He's saying, number one, what is the true gospel as opposed to a false gospel? And number two, what is a true Christian as opposed to a false Christian? Now he addresses other issues as well, but those are two big ones. And at one point he says, how can you tell if someone who says, I'm a Christian, is a Christian? And he says, the way you can tell is you can tell by the fruit in their life. And in Galatians chapter 5, he says you should be able to taste this fruit. Now, he doesn't say fruits in the plural, fruit in the singular. And he says and when you taste this fruit, it should taste of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. He said that's what you should taste. In other words, Paul is saying, look, some of you are questioning whether I'm a Christian or not. Bite me. But he's saying it in a very nice way. Taste the fruit in my life. If someone says they have encountered Jesus Christ and he is in their heart, this is what their life should take off, taste of. But if what you taste is envy, murder, lust, malice, anger, and so on, you have every right to question the fruit. Does that make sense? If I gave you an apple and it tasted like an orange, you would say, I'm pretty sure this is an orange. Now, with genetics these days, we're getting very close to making apples taste like oranges. So, but you know what I'm saying? So Paul says, look, taste it. And if you have tasted something different in other Christians' lives, I'm sorry about that. 
find a church, or maybe this church, where there is a reality to the fruit that you taste. Don't let the fake put you off the real. Come somewhere where people are genuinely living it out. We are not perfect. So we will make mistakes and times let you down. But you can look at the overall trajectory in someone's life and you learn to respect them when you see them keep going in the same direction all the way. I have the huge joy and privilege of working with Dr. Ravi Zacharias. I love him deeply, not because I think he's perfect. He isn't perfect. And for a couple of lakhs, I'll give you a list of things where he fails. But <laughs> the reason why I love him is because I see this heart and this attitude pursuing these things for a long time in the same way. And so you encounter all these things, and you think there is a reality to your walk with Christ here that I can recognize and I can see. Don't let the presence of the fake put you off the real. But maybe you are in, you know, and if you have met a lot of fake Christians, does that make sense? Be hypocrite, people who are pretending to be Christians, send us their names and addresses because we would like to visit them. Now, this existential disappointment isn't, however, sometimes just to do with us as people. Sometimes it's directly to do with God. Sometimes we feel that God somehow has let us down. And very often, uh, the way we rationalize it goes like this. God, I've been trying to do my best for you. I've been trying to uphold my side of the bargain. But somehow, nothing seems to be coming back the other way. And it doesn't matter how hard I try, it's not working out. As a matter of fact... It's going the other way. It's getting harder and harder. It's getting worse and worse. I'm tired of trying. Now here we have to think very carefully. Because in effect what we're saying is, God, I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying my very best to be as good as I can. And because I'm trying so hard to be good, you should be loving me and blessing me. But you're not blessing me. Now there is a very painful response to this. And it's really quite simple. If you are coming before God and saying, God, I'm a good person, I'm doing good things for you, here's the painful answer. There are no good people. When Jesus Christ was asked the question, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He asked the young man asking him, why do you call me good? Then Jesus answered his own question. Only God alone is good. So let's run it together. If you have to be good to go to heaven, and only God is good, who is going? No one, apart from God. Your application to join the Trinity has been refused. You do not meet the minimum entry requirements. We are not as good as God. We are not perfect. And if you believe you are perfect, the only way to break that cycle of self-deception is to get married. I don't know if you know the story of a young boy and he desperately wanted a bicycle for Christmas. He wanted it so much. And it got to Christmas Eve and he'd searched the whole house. There were no bicycle-shaped presents anywhere to be seen and he was beginning to panic. Maybe he wouldn't get his wish. He'd made it very clear to everybody. He'd been praying for it. He'd told his friends, his family, his aunties, his uncles, brothers, sisters, because everybody knew this is all he wanted. And so now he's upset. So he leans against his bed the day before Christmas and he prays. He says, Lord Jesus, all I want for Christmas is a bicycle. That's all I want. Nothing else. If you give me a bicycle, I promise for one whole month I will be good. I will do nothing wrong. Just send me a bicycle. Amen. And he gets into bed. And then he's an intelligent boy. He begins thinking. He begins thinking how hard it is not to get into trouble at school. How hard it is. And a month is a very long time for perfection. So he gets back out of bed. He leans and he says, okay, Jesus. One week. I won't do anything wrong for a week. I will be perfect before you. Send me a bicycle in return. Amen. He gets back into bed. But then he's thinking about his parents. His mother, his father. You know, he doesn't tidy his room. He doesn't clean up after himself. He knows he's going to get into trouble with one of them. He gets back out of bed. He says, Lord Jesus, how about a day? I'll be perfect tomorrow in exchange for a bicycle. But even as he's praying that, he's thinking of his sister, who is so annoying. 
She, last year at the Christmas table, she sat next to him with her finger out like this, right next to his shoulder. And when he bumped into it, she said, it's not me poking him, he keeps moving into me. So that's not going to work. And then he suddenly remembers that right across the street where he lives, there's a very small old church. And in that church, he knows that there's a small statue of Mary just by the door as you come in, because he's been in there before. So he sneaks out of the house, and he opens the door of the church. It's not locked. And he takes this statue. He brings it back into the house, and he puts it into his wardrobe, and he locks the door. He gets down on his knees, and he says, Okay, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again. (laughs) We are not good people. We all fail, all of us. That's the truth. We can't relate to God on this way. As a matter of fact, in the book of Galatians, earlier in the book of Galatians, in chapter 1, Paul says, Cursed be anyone who comes and preach another gospel to you. And Paul talks about two gospels in chapter 1. Now, when he uses the word another, in the Greek language that Galatians was written in, there are two ways of saying another. The first word means another of the same thing. Would you like another biscuit? Implying you've had one biscuit, right? You're going to have another biscuit. But then you can say, would you like another thing? It's a different thing. Does that make sense? So you want something else. It's just different to what you had. Yeah. So, you know, chicken birani or something like that. It's not another biscuit. It's another thing. It's something else to eat. It's something different. So Paul says, look, there are two gospels, but there's only one true gospel. There's one, and then there's another one which is totally different. He says that the false gospel goes like this. If I obey the law and if I try hard, you, God, will reward me and love me. And Paul says, cursed is the person who preaches this gospel and cursed is the one who believes it. Imagine that. Imagine doing something because you thought it would make you blessed and instead you feel cursed as a result. What a terrible thing. The gospel that brings a curse is a gospel that says, try hard to be good and God will bless you. Paul said there is only one true gospel, and it always brings a blessing. It is a gospel that says this, God, I'm sorry that I have done wrong. I'm sorry that I have failed you. Thank you, you sent Jesus to forgive me. Please, Lord, forgive me through your son, through his death and resurrection. Forgive me, make me whole. And Jesus says, Paul says, that gospel, it brings a blessing. Blessed is the one who preaches it, and blessed is the one who receives it. Do you know that love in your life? Do you have that sense? Are you trying to win approval from God? Love and approval are not the same thing. Approval is something which we earn by acting in a certain way. But love is something that we may receive even when we don't deserve it. And God loves us. Do you know that love? It will not disappoint. When it's shed abroad in your heart, it says in Romans chapter 5, it will not disappoint you. Rather, it will motivate you to a great life in him. And your life will look different and you will act differently, not because you have to, but because you want to. That is the power of love. I don't know if um, any of you are familiar with a a little book that was written many years ago called The Dangerous Duty of Delight. Um, But in it, it makes, draws this point out very, very clearly. There was a, a Christian theologian I don't know how long ago he lived now, maybe more than a hundred years or so, uh, called Carnell. And Carnell was writing once a theological essay, and he said, gave an illustration. He said, suppose a man came to his wife and said, must I kiss you goodnight every night? He said, supposing a man came to his wife and said, must I kiss you goodnight each night? He said, what will she say? He said, she will say, Unless a spontaneous affection for my person motivates you, your overtures are stripped of moral beauty. Now, personally, I think she would slap him. But he is a theologian philosopher, so that's what he thinks she will say. What he's saying is, she's saying you, you have to, but it's not that kind of have to. You must. It's not that kind of must. I I do a lot of uh, travel around the world, and as any of you who have that kind of lifestyle know, the big challenge of that is who you leave behind. So I'm very often away from my wife and my kids. 
Now, right at the top of my road, not very far from the top of my road, there is a florist. And you can ask Lucy, I love buying flowers. Very often there are flowers in my home. So let's suppose I've been away for a long time. And as I'm coming home, I just stop at this flower shop. A hundred yards from where I live, I buy Anne some flowers. I put them behind my back. I come and I, I knock on the door. She opens the door and I go, ta-da, these are for you. And she looks at them and she says, Michael, these, these flowers, they're so beautiful. You shouldn't have done it. Why did you? And I say, it was my duty. There's something very deficient in that answer, isn't there? You see, there is something I can do that would bring no joy to her whatsoever. Let's suppose I've been away for a long time. I go home. Uh, um, and I stop off at the florist, I buy flowers, I knock on the door, she opens the door, I go, ta-da, these are for you. And she looks at them and she says, Michael, they're beautiful, you shouldn't have, why did you do it? And I say, because I love you so not much, nothing else makes me happy than to make you happy. As a matter of fact, I've arranged a babysitter tonight, I'm going to take you out to your favorite restaurant, there's nothing I would rather do than spend the whole evening with you. Now, when I say that to her, she never looks at me and says, what do you mean there's nothing you would rather do? Why don't you think about me? How can you always be so selfish thinking about you all the time? Now, why doesn't she say that? It's because it's the nature of love to delight yourself in the other. That's the nature of a loving relationship. Whether it's between brothers and sisters or close friends or family or husband and wife. And that's the relationship God longs to have with us. We do things for him because... We must, but it's not a must because it's that kind of must. It's a must because we love him so much. Do you know that relationship with him? Do you know that love? Now, the last way in which people think the Christian faith has failed is moral. Now, there are so many different ways I can pick up this. I, I, I'm going to focus it just in one. This is something I've been thinking about for, for a long time because I hear the question so often. I can remember many years ago speaking in the UK and um, I was asked by some university students to come and talk to them about truth and judgment. And the argument goes something like this. You Christians, you talk about love a lot. You say your God is a God of love. But there's all this judgment in the Bible. And you're always talking about judgment. So which one is it? Is he this loving God who accepts everybody? Or is he this judging God who looks at people and says, no, you're wrong. Which one is it? Now, this is a very important question. A lot of people wrestle with this. Even a lot of Christians wrestle with this. Does God have two characters? One in the Old Testament, where he specializes in wrath and judgment. And then one in the New Testament, where he specializes in love and being kind. You know, and maybe at the end of the Old Testament period, God gathered all of the archangels together. And by the way, some people think Gabriel is an archangel. But that's not true. He's just a regular angel. There's only one named archangel in Scripture. His name is Michael. I'm, I'm just telling you that. <laughs> but let's suppose he gathers whoever the other archangels are together. He says, guys, we need to have a rethink through this whole missionary strategy. Because I don't think this war and wrath thing is working for me. And one of the archangels goes, love. That's a better message. And not only that, towards the end of the 20th century, the Beatles will come along. You know, this music band, and they'll sing about love. It'll become really trendy. Everybody will be into it. You know, why don't we refashion the message for that? Is that what he did? A PR makeover? Now, the thing is, is you'll read about God's love and judgment in both parts of the Bible. So God's character hasn't changed. And yet we still struggle at this moral level. God, can I truly trust you? Are you morally trustworthy? Now the reason we get so confused about this is that we don't spend enough time thinking about the word love. So let's just start there. Now I don't know if any of you have read Jane Austen's book Pride and Prejudice. Have any of you read that? Yeah. Have any of you seen the BBC series in six parts on Pride and Prejudice? If you have seen that, I see a few of you nodding, you'll notice how much I look like Mr. Darcy. But if you haven't seen it, if you've never even heard of Pride of Prejudice, the probability is that you're male and single. So let me, let me just tell you a little bit about this story. It's one of the most, most enduring love stories 
of English literature of the last few hundred years. It's why they're still making so many films about it. There are Bollywood versions of it, Hollywood versions of it, English versions of it. I mean, it's just such a popular story. It tells the love story between a very beautiful, if at times proud young woman called Elizabeth and a very handsome um, uh, and at times sort of prejudiced man, uh, Mr. Darcy. Or the pride and prejudice is the other way around, sorry. But it's this love story between Darcy and Elizabeth. Now, Mr. Darcy falls in love with Elizabeth, but he doesn't realize it. And there's a very important moment in the book where he calls on her household to visit her, but there is nobody there. The servants are there, but she is on her own. All of the family are out. And so as he's shown into the room and he finds himself alone in a room with this woman, he immediately bows his head and he apologizes. And he said, you, mu you must allow me to apologize. If I had known you were unaccompanied, I would not have called. Because as an English gentleman, he cannot be alone in a room with a woman to whom he is not married. And I'd like to say, as the father of two daughters, I believe this is the godly, biblical, and only way in which this society should be organized. And so, having apologized, he turns around and he starts to leave. And he is literally halfway out of the door when he stops. He turns around, he re-enters the room and he looks at her. And he says, it will not do. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. Now, gentlemen, listen carefully. That line is a winner. <laughs> However, he goes on to say that he loves her against his will, against his reason, and against his own better character. She refuses this declaration, and being a man, he can't understand why. So he comes back and says, how do you so easily reject me? And she says, you told me that you loved me, even though it went against your will, even though it went against all reason, even though it went against your own better moral character. In other words, she is saying, you told me you loved me, even though it goes against all better judgment. You see, true love doesn't exist in the absence of judgment. True love exists in the presence of it. I don't know if any of you have um, uh, ever come across a uh, uh, very famous philosophical treatise written on love. It was published a couple of, about, I don't know, 15 years ago, I think. It's really remarkable. The, the, the philosophical essay was called Where is the Love? And it was written by a group of philosophers called the Black Eyed Peas. Uh, some of you may be familiar with them. And here is what they say. People killing, people dying, children hurt, you hear them crying. Can you practice what you preach? Would you turn the other cheek? Father, 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 help us. Send us some guidance from above. Because people have me questioning. Where is the love? I feel the weight of the world on my shoulders. As I get older, people get colder. Most of us only care about money making. Selfishness got us following the wrong direction. Wrong information is always shown in the media. Negative images are the main criteria. Although in their song... They say negative images is the main criteria, but I've corrected the grammar because that's not quite right. Infecting young minds faster than bacteria, kids want to act like they see in the cinema. Whatever happened to the values of humanity? Whatever happened to fairness and equality? Instead of spreading love, we're spreading animosity, lack of understanding, leading lives away from unity. But here's the killer bit. Here's what they say. The truth is kept secret. It's swept under the rug. If you've never known truth, then you've never known love. The truth is kept secret. It's swept under a rug. If you've never known truth, then you've never known love. They're absolutely right. Most of us are so desperate to be loved in this world, we go around projecting an image of ourselves to other people. The trouble with that is people fall in love with the image as opposed to the reality. They don't know the real us. They only know the image around us. This is why the very rich, the very powerful, the very beautiful sometimes find it very hard to find real love, real friendship. People only fall in love with the image surrounding them. They never get to know the real them. So I can promise you something. Even if you're the most popular person in the room, and everybody looks up to you, if there is no one who knows the real you, 
No one who knows your weaknesses, your failings, your shortcomings and still loves you, if no one knows you that way, you are terribly lonely. However, if there are a few people in this world and they do know the real you, they know your weaknesses, your failings, that dark side to your character. If there are people who know you like that and they like you and they love you, those are the closest relationships you have. Because true love doesn't exist in the absence of judgment. True love exists in the presence of it. When someone who knows you completely and sees how you've messed up in every way in your life and yet still says, I love you, that is the most meaningful declaration you have. And this is one of the reasons why in our 21st century world so many young people are leading such empty lives devoid of real relationships. Nobody knows them. We only know people through their Facebook page and their Instagram page and their whatever page. I've stopped trying to talk about these things. I realized I got into trouble once talking to my kids and I used the phrase, the Facebook. And they all fell about laughing. I don't, have you heard the rumor that um, Twitter, Facebook, um, uh, and um, YouTube are all going to merge into one giant company with a new URL, www.utwitface.com. <laughs> there, all these things do, all these media do, and as many good things as they allow us to do, all they do is encourage us to project an image of ourselves to everybody else, where everything looks perfect, everything looks beautiful, everything looks good. My son, James, has a phone the Galaxy S7, and if you take a selfie, you can hit a button, and it's called the, like, I don't know, selfie improver. It smooths the skin, lightens the color, and makes your eyes bigger. <laughs> he took a picture of himself and said, watch this. He hit the button, I was like, terrified. It was like something from a science fiction movie. We're constantly projecting an image of ourselves to everyone else, and no one ever gets to see the reality. And we're so lonely. And yet this is precisely the way in which God loves us. God sees the real you. He knows all of your failings, all of your shortcomings, all of your weaknesses, and yet he loves you. He's not fooled into thinking you're better than you are. He knows what you do in secret. There are no secrets before him. And yet he loves you, and that is what makes his love so meaningful. In the book of the Old Testament, in the book of Jonah, there's a very interesting complaint brought before God. Basically, Jonah is sent to a group of people he hates. He hates them. Okay? The Ninevites in the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was one of the most evil empires of the ancient world. I mean, truly awful. And he's sent to go and tell them, you must repent or you'll be judged. But he doesn't want them to repent and be forgiven. He wants them destroyed. He hates them that much. Have you ever noticed how often when we talk about justice, what we actually want is revenge? Do any of you watch James Bond films? Put, put up your hand. Don't be ashamed if you watch James Bond movies. Shame on you. <laughs> you need to stop wasting your time watching all that rubbish. I, I watch James Bond movies because I have to do cultural research and analysis. <laughs> now, I'll never forget when the film Goldeneye was first released in the UK. And I got to go and see, you know, one of the first screenings of it. And the way that movie ends is James Bond is fighting the bad guy. What there is, is there's this huge lake, and the lake drains, and it reveals this giant, enormous concrete basin with a metal wires running over the middle and a big needle in the middle of the basin. It's a huge, giant radar display. Okay, but it's disguised as a lake. So all the water runs out, and now you've got this giant radar and they're fighting on the wires which are holding the needle in the middle of the radar display which controls satellites in outer space. And of course, it looks like James Bond's going to die, but he doesn't die. No one's died almost as many times as him. And then there's a big reversal. And now the bad guy, it, you know, he's hanging on by his fingertips. And there's like a 200-foot drop to the concrete basin below. And as he's hanging by his fingertips, you can see in James Bond's eyes, because he hates this guy, he's thinking... Do I need to save you? Should I reach out my hand and pull you up or not? Because he's a terrible person. But the bad guy, he loses his grip and he starts to fall. Okay, so you see now the angle like James, from James Bond's eyes looking down. You see the man fall. He's getting smaller and smaller as he hurtles towards the ground. Then you have a wide angle shot. You see him falling ah, all the way from, to the ground. Then you have another camera looking up from the ground up. 
and you can see the body getting bigger and bigger. Ah! Back to the wide angle. Ah! Back from the thing is getting smaller and smaller. Ah! And then he lands on his back like that, smack on the concrete. Now, I have no professional medical training, but I have reason to believe if you fall 250 feet and land on your head, you're dead. Is he dead? Oh, no. He opens his eyes just in time to see a huge explosion that releases the large metal spike in the middle of the radar array. Now the metal spike comes down to him. Okay, you have a, the wide angle shot. You can hear him screaming. Ah, you have the view from his eyes looking up as it's getting bigger. Ah, the view from the needle going down. His mouth is getting bigger. And then all of a sudden the skewer goes down and it skewers him into the ground. And everyone in the cinema stood up and started applauding like this. So often when we think of people we don't like, we want them destroyed. And we celebrate when they are. And we think that's justice. Jonah's problem, the reason Jonah brings this complaint before God is he says, God, you sent me to go and speak to them and you forgave them and I didn't want you to forgive them. That's what he says in Jonah chapter 4. The reason I didn't want to go is I know you are a gracious and compassionate God, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life. It's better for me to die than to live. Now, that word we have in the English language, compassion, it comes from the ecclesiastical Latin. It means to make a moral judgment about something and be moved inside to do something about it. Does that make sense? So you have compassion when you see poverty and you make a moral judgment. That is wrong. And then you're moved in your being to do something about, about it. That's compassion. If you don't do anything about it, you don't have compassion. You have moralizing. You have compassion in the face of racism when you make a moral judgment. That is wrong. And then you're moved in your being to do something about it. If you're not moved to do anything about it, you don't have compassion. You have moralizing again. The God of the Bible is compassionate. He looks into every human heart and he says, that is wrong. And then he's moved in the depth of his being to do something about it. And that is the cross. Jesus Christ comes as God into this world. God himself is born into this world. He lives a perfect life amongst us. And when he goes to the cross, he takes all the sin in your life and all the sin in my life. All the terrible things we have done, imagined, all the penalty it deserves, all of that he takes on into himself. And he becomes sin for us on the cross. He pays the penalty for us on the cross. He bears our sins. And through his death and his resurrection, he pays the price and he comes now and he offers to pay ours. He says, I have paid for you. He extends his hands and he offers us forgiveness as a gift. Have you ever received it? When you receive this gift of forgiveness with God from, through Christ, you will have perfect peace with God. Do you have peace with God? Do you know you can stand in front of him, look him in the eye, and talk to him? Uh, I see there are some university students here. Some of you may even remember this. I'm sure none of you ever did this. When I was, when I was a law student, for example, if when I was walking through the law department, I saw one of my law professors and I was late with an essay, as soon as I saw them coming, I would look down like this. And if there was an empty room, I would step inside it and allow them to walk past. I'm sure you've never had this experience. Because you don't want to look them in the eye. It's a small thing, but you, you just don't want to get into trouble. Have you ever noticed how when we do something wrong against a friend, we normally only tell them as much as we need to tell them in order for them to forgive us? Have you noticed that? So you've done whatever it is. You don't tell them everything because then they would hate you. You tell them 80%. I'm sorry I did this and this and, you know, you know it was a mistake. Actually, it wasn't a mistake. You did it deliberately. Okay? You know, please forgive me. And they go, oh, thank you so much for telling me. They put their arm around you. It's good, right? What do you live in fear of? You live in fear that one day they'll find out the remaining 20%. What do you mean they posted it on Instagram and sent it to a million people? They didn't tell me that. So we live in fear of the bit that we haven't told. Does that make sense? Which it makes for an uneasy peace. But the forgiveness that God offers from us is unlike anything else. He already knows everything. He already sees everything. He's already seen the wrong you have done that you don't even want to admit to yourself. 
He sees the shame that we sometimes wrestle with. He sees the pain. He sees all of it and he says, I love you. I've seen all of this and I love you. And not only that, I have come into this world to rescue you. I have paid the price for what you have done so you can be forgiven, so you can be set free, so that you can be different, so you don't need to feel the shame. You don't need to feel the cause. I can set you free from it. That's why Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I am the truth, Jesus Christ said. I see everything and I have paid for everything. Do you know that peace with him? In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says this, and with this we're going to end. This is Paul now writing about Jesus Christ. He says, And Jesus died for all, that those who should live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and was raised to life again. From now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Jesus Christ this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the, the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And that is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, now is the time of his favor. And now is the time of salvation. Have you re received him? Do you need to respond to him? Is it possible that you once knew him, you've gone so far away from him, no one will be able to look at your life and even tell you're a Christian anymore and you need to come back to him today? Or is it possible that you've always been on the outside looking in? You're wondering why it's so hard trying to be a Christian and what you realize is that you have never received Christ. You have never had him come and live in you and been filled with his spirit. So you're filled with this new desire to live for him and to glorify him and to please him. That you're doing all these things not because you have to, but because you want to. Well, if you're in those countries, I'd love to be able to pray for you. Just a simple prayer that says, Jesus, I need you. I need this forgiveness. I need this peace. Thank you that you know me, that you love me, that you see all this mess. And yet you love me so much, you came in this world to rescue me. And I need that rescue. Thank you for your cross, for your life. Thank you, you're raised to life. May I walk with you. If that's the prayer you need to pray, then thank you for listening to me. You've been so gracious and so kind. It's been a blessing for me to be here with you. Thank you. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.